Good morning, Cisco cohort. It's time to go ahead and start today's class. It's Tuesday, October the 27th, about nine o'clock in the morning. And today we're scheduled to cover the chapter three material or the module, the module three material on security. Um, the laboratory for this particular chapter is not something you can do on packet tracer or even on real Cisco equipment. It just simply involves using a, a client PC running, it can be running Windows, it can be running Macintosh. And the only thing that's needed besides the standard Windows operating system or the Mac OS operating system is the Wireshark program. Because they're gonna have you go into the Wireshark program and, and view some of the packet capture abilities of that program. So I put a link in the recorded presentations link of my TCC Blackboard uh, where all the videos are put, like the today's video, today's session after, shortly after it ends, it'll be put into the recorded presentations. Uh, the YouTube link will be in there where you can see this. Um, so those of you that want to come on Thursday, we'll do it on our, our PCs and the, in the um, uh, computer science laboratory we already have Wireshark installed on them. Uh, Wireshark is a free program, free open source program. Doesn't cost anything to put it on your PC. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the uh, uh, well, a brief PowerPoint presentation that I wrote first on security, CompTIA security in five minutes, and then we'll go into the official presentation for this particular uh, for this particular module. Okay, so I'm gonna go to share and share a file and share this file. And it should show up on your screen here. Let me check on the other machine, make sure it's shown up properly. Okay, so here we go. So CIA triple A. Oh, what does that mean? Well, the Central Intelligence Agency and the American Automobile Association. Well, uh, these particular initials is in security. Uh, we're gonna talk about some basics of security concepts here. So it doesn't stand for that at all. As a matter of fact, uh, the first CIA is confidentiality. This is a concept that when you put something on a computer system, it's confidential and you're the only person that can see it unless you deliberately share it with somebody else. So if you work at a company where they have a drive where you're, maybe you work in the uh, secret marketing department and we're writing the secret marketing plan for next year and it's so secret and confidential, we don't even want the rest of the employees to see it yet. They might leak it to a trade magazine or leak it to a competitor. So we can using, using uh, uh, server operating system features like read and privileges and write privileges and so forth. We can we can set the confidentiality of this. So if you want to, you're the only person that can see it. Or maybe you might choose it with the other people in your group that are writing the marketing plan and they want to see it. So this is one of the triads of the of the uh, of, uh, of the security. Confidentiality means um, it's secret and no one else can see it unless you choose to share it with them. Integrity means. The data is not going to have the ability to be altered by someone else who has an interest in changing it. For example, if you transfer $10 from your checking account to your savings account, <clears throat> no one can go in there and change it and say, uh, you take $100 out of your savings account and only $10 ends up in your checking account. The other $90 goes in the hands of some hacker, criminal, malicious user, threat actor that's, that's stealing your money. So we do some things to maintain integrity with systems. We use RAID driver rays so that if a drive fails, uh, uh, we won't lose our data. We back everything up to backup drives. So if a drive fails, uh, we can restore store it from last night's backup. And you know we don't want to lose our accounts receivable file or our company, our business will fail. So integrity means the data is going to remain as it should be, and a hacker is not going to be able to come in and mess up, mess up your secret company data. Availability means that I can get to the data. Of course, I'm going to have to sign onto my account with my name and my secret password. But once I do that, I'm going to be able to get to the account. I'm going to be able to get to my account and see my data, and it will be available to me wherever I have internet connectivity or company local area network connectivity. 
to where I can get get to that data. So some people, well, let's see, let's take a look at the some. Uh, have you, uh, I think the term is hacktivist. That's an activist that has computer hacking skills, so we call them a hacktivist. So let's see now, Amazon Prime Day, that's come and gone, hasn't it? Let's see, let's say the hackers decided, the hacktivists decided that on Amazon Prime Day, they didn't want everybody else in the world to legitimately get to Amazon and get a good deal on a tablet or something. So they did a denial of service attack on Amazon and swamped them with, with bogus traffic and it made it more difficult for legitimate customers to connect to Amazon and be able to get to that traffic. So that's availability. We should keep the, everything should be available. We're gonna do things, uh, 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 multiple paths through our network so we can always have one available path and uh, make sure our, uh, we're using RAID driver rays so that uh, the drive doesn't fail and remove the availability from you to get to your data. Okay, so confidentiality, confidentiality integrity, and availability, not Central Intelligence Agency, but CIA is a, a, a well, the prime, concept, a triad of information security. We want to maintain confidentiality, integrity, and availability at all times. This is what it keeps our security guys awake at night and looking out for all the ransomware guys are going to come and you know lock up all your data. It's no longer available. And if you don't pay the ransom, they're going to release it to the public. And some organizations, that's a that's very bad. For example, medical records or secret government records, uh, they don't want that stuff to be revealed. So that's the, the the thing that the hackers are using over the, the ransomware guys who are using over their victims now is not just pay us the money to get your data back. They're saying, well, if you don't pay us the money to get your data back, we're going to release all your data to everybody else in the world. So nice guys, huh? Okay, uh, AAA, not American Automobile Ale Association, but this is a, the other three three-legged stool thing of, of security. Authentication means that. Uh, I need to know who you are before I'm going to give you access to the computer system. So prove that you are who you say you are. So authentication is putting in the name of your account and the password, which you only should have your secret password that nobody else should know. So the system's going to authenticate you with that. Uh, knowing the password, there's, there's three things we can use to authenticate you on the system. You ever heard the term two-factor authentication, 2FA? I can. I can, uh, I can authenticate authenticate you based upon something only you should know, like the password you made up. No one else knows that. Never tell your password to anybody else. There's no reason to tell your password to anybody else. Um, another thing I'll, I can authenticate you on is something you have. For example, when you go to the uh, ATM machine to get your money back, you have to know your four-digit PIN code. That's something you know, but you also have to have the ATM card because there's a magnetic strip on the back or a computer chip on it uh, that's unique to you. And you can't just go to an ATM machine and you forgot your ATM card. You can't get money back from it. Oh, I know my PIN code. Well, no, you have to have the card and put it in there too. So that's two-factor authentication, something you know and something you have. And the third authentication thing is something something you are. So... You probably are, have already heard that when you go to an ATM machine and get the money back out of it, they take a photograph of you when you're doing it. So that way, if you know somebody's holding a gun to your head and making you get the money out, you can prove that you did it under your duress, and maybe they'll give you your money back. So in that uh, Terminator movie where the guy used his thumbprint to press it on the lock and go into the secret research lab, that's something you are. Um, the ATM bank people are experimenting with take a photograph of you anyway whenever you go to an ATM machine. Um, one of the things that makes you unique besides your fingerprint is the pattern of the blood cells in your eye, your iris uh, pattern. And so they're experimenting with uh, being able to photograph your eyeball and authenticate that you're actually that person and not some other person that stole the card and just to, you know, uh, uh, figure it out what the, what the four-digit PIN code was. Yeah, a lot of people think this is really creepy. Yeah, so they don't talk too much about that. So authentication is being able to prove who you are, usually with just a password. But maybe sometimes you go to a website and you go to your Google Mail from some other computer you've never gone to before. 
and you put in the correct password and he says, we don't recognize this computer. I want to send a secret code to your telephone, which only you should have. And put in this little code I sent you to your telephone so we can make sure someone else just doesn't guess your password. So anything better than single factor authentication is better. The dual factor, two factor authentication, something you know, something you have, something you are is the basis of that. Authorization is once you know your correct password, and you can get onto the system. Well, once you authorize yourself on the web advisor system, uh, well, we know it's you because you knew the password. And now you're authorized to, oh, say, sign up for classes in, in the spring or see your transcript or see how much you owe on your bill. Uh, so based upon your password, the authentication function, which log you into the system, now we're going to authorize you to do certain functions on that system. So in a business, um, who should be authorized to see the payroll files? Well, I would love to be able to see the payroll files and modify them. I would put a couple of extra zeros in, the, in my particular salary file. Well, you know, they needed someone to teach Cisco so much here that they said, Mark, come here and teach, and you can, you can name your own salary. Yeah, I call mine, I name mine George. Hey, we're teachers, we don't get paid very much. So authorization is what should, you should be able to do. The only people who are authorized to get into that payroll file and do, say, when someone gets a raise or gets a promotion, would be the payroll clerk, maybe the vice president of finance, something like that. So as a student, you would be only authorized to see your transcript. You can't see anybody else's transcript. You would be able to sign yourself up for classes. You can't sign up anybody else for classes. So that's the authorization function. And finally, we have the accounting function, which means that all servers and computer devices have ability to create log files of when somebody signs onto the system. So when I used to work in the 90s for the college textbook company, there was a Patrick in accounting. He used to come in on the weekends and do the end of month reports. So when I looked at the at log files, I would say, yeah, it looks like Patrick signed on Sunday morning and worked on his end of month Excel spreadsheet here on the Novell file server. I could see that from the log files. On the other hand, if I saw some activity in the log files from, you know, um, from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. on a Tuesday evening, Patrick never comes in on Tuesday evening. So I would say, Patrick, you didn't happen to come in and work from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. on the system, did you? Just, no, I didn't do that. So I would know that somebody was broken into the system and I'd have to try to fix that with the accounting function. So you authenticate with the password and you get the authorization function, some system administrator will grant you read privileges or write privileges to those files you need to do to do your job. And then the accounting function will be able to check and see, and is this a reasonable hour that this person might have logged in to do this type of stuff? Triple A. Now let's talk about encryption. Uh, one of the basics of security is we want to do some type of encryption of data because when you look at this Wireshark program that you guys are going to do this lab with later this week, it's able to see all the data. You can snoop on all the data in any packet. And if the, if, if the data is not encrypted, then you can see the plain words, the plain text, what was in there. So there are some protocols that don't encrypt the data. For example, the FTP file transfer protocol program or the Telnet program that we use to Telnet into a switch or a router. It doesn't encrypt your name or your password when you log into it. Oh, now I know your name and your password. And you're probably, like most people, you're lazy, you use the same password everywhere. So if we encrypt something, Maybe instead of using uh, Telnet, I might want to use Secure Shell. That's going to encrypt my name and my password. It's also going to encrypt everything else in the whole session. So let's talk about how we encrypt stuff. So there are, are one method is called a shared secret key, symmetric shared secret key. It's like the same key locks and unlocks everything. The advantage of this shared key is that it's very, very fast. In other words, the the code, the lines of code that you write to do the encryption and decryption, when it's the same exact key that encrypts it and decrypts it, is very fast. So this is the one I want to use when you log on to a web server and you want to like go to Amazon and put in your credit card number or go to your bank and check how much money is in your bank account. You don't want anybody else, anybody else seeing that stuff. That's your own personal private stuff. So it would be best if we could use a symmetric shared secret key to do this so we get very fast processing time. But we have a problem. How do I get the shared key to you first? Uh, well, I have to get the shared key to you 
first, you don't have the key yet. We can't do encryption with that. So we need to, we want to use a shared secret key to figure out another method of getting to you that's slower and clunkier. But once I get that shared key to you with that method, then we can switch to symmetric shared function and speed everything up real fast. So here's where asymmetric keys come in. Asymmetric keys are a key pair in that we're going to generate two keys. We're going to call one private and we're going to call one public. The private one I will never reveal to anybody. I'm going to keep it on a secret file on my hard drive. The public one, I'm going to world plus dog. Everybody gets this. Now, the way asymmetric keys work is that if I encrypt something with one of these keys, only the other key can decrypt it. So if I publish a public key to the world and you want to send me a secret message, you will encrypt it with my public key and send it to me. Only I will be able to decrypt the message and see you, see your message because I'm the only one that has the private key. So this method is used to uh, uh, facilitate transmitting a secret shared symmetrical key from a web server to a web client when using like HTTPS, when you're doing banking information or, or credit card information. The disadvantage is it's very, very slow, but it's foolproof and that I can send you a public key and then you can encrypt something and send it back to me and only I can see it. Well, if you're a web browser client and you're trying to talk to a web server like a banking server, you can send them your public key. He can send you his public key and then you can encrypt everything to send to the bank and no one will be able to see it but the bank. And then the bank can send something to you and only you'll be able to see it because only you, you only have the key to decrypt that stuff. So what normally happens here is we're going to use a, we're going to use public private key pairs, asymmetric key pairs initially when we establish a session with a banking website or a merchant website where we're going to use credit card information. Then we're going to use that just to exchange the shared secret key. Very slow, but since we're only exchanging 128 bits of a shared secret key or something like this, it won't take that much time. Then we'll switch to the shared secret key. Now both parties have the shared symmetrical secret key and we'll switch to those lines of code that are very, very fast. And I'm going to use an allegory here. Um, this guy who's the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, used to be head of the Russian equivalent of what our uh, CIA was. It's called the KGB. Uh, they've changed its name now. It's the KGB is a secret intelligence spy agency that spies on everybody else. So every country has this. Russia, North Korea, United States, everybody's got this stuff. So let's say we have a guy working in the uh, diplomatic uh, uh, building in Moscow. He's supposed to be a diplomat, but he's really a spy. And we want to send him the secret microfish, the micro dot. We want to send it to him. And I've got a box that I can lock and put the microfilm in. And it's got a, it's got a thing on it where you can, put, you can put two locks on it if you want to. It's got a big enough hasp on it. I want to send that to him, but the problem is, how do I send in the key to the lock <clears throat> so he can open it? Well, if I send the key to him in the mail in the envelope, the KGB is going to steam open the envelope and make a copy of the key. And they're going to be able to open the box and see what's in it. So how do I get that information to him in a secret method? Well, here's what you could do. Um, go down to the True Value Hardware Store here in Texas and buy a padlock and a key. Put the microfilm in the box and close the box and lock the padlock. And you keep the key and you mail it to your CIA guy that's in Moscow. A guy in Moscow goes down to the True Value Hardware Store in Moscow. He buys a second padlock. And he places, he doesn't try to open up the box. He doesn't have the key. He buys a second padlock and he puts it on the box and he locks it and he keeps the key. And he mails it back to you. At this point, you take off your padlock and mail it back to Moscow. And now the secret agent in Moscow has the box that's locked on it with the padlock that he has the key to. He opens up the box, he gets a secret microfilm, and we're doing our secret spy communications just fine. Just like spy versus spy, you know, in Mad Magazine. So shared symmetric keys are like that. They essentially share keys with each other, but they each have their own secret key. Just like these guys each have their own padlock.
Okay, now I'm going to stop sharing that and we're going to start doing the actual uh, slides for this one. Here we go, Network Security Concepts. <clears throat> okay, so here are some security terms. Asset is something that's of value to an organization. For example, a secret marketing plan from the marketing department. I don't want anybody to get that until it's actually ready to be released and published. A vulnerability is some weakness that can be exploited. For example, uh, the Cisco iOS operating system and the routers about 15 years ago had a vulnerability that even if you didn't know the enable secret password, you could use a web uh, exploit and change the configuration of the router. That's a vulnerability. So a threat is a danger to the company's assets. I'm going to exploit some vulnerability like a web server ex uh, uh, weakness in the code. And I'm going to uh, be a threat to a company. I'm going to mess up the configuration of this router, and he won't be able to. to his, um, always won't be able to have network functionality. So an exploit is a mechanism that takes advantage of some vulnerability and allows me to mess with your system. Now mitigation is like insurance. Uh, uh, if I didn't want anybody to steal my car, I could lock it in a super high fence with guard dogs, an electrified fence, and razor barbed wire on top, and it would be harder for someone to steal my car, but that would be expensive, and it would be difficult for me to get the card every time I want to use it. Well, why not I just purchase insurance? And that way, if someone steals my car, the insurance will pay me, and I'll just buy another car. So mitigation is something that reduces the severity of a potential threat or risk. So a risk is a likelihood of some threat. What is the risk that someone is going to steal my car? Probably, I've got a 15-year-old car, probably kind of low, but still I still have to purchase automobile insurance for it. And if someone did steal it, I have collision insurance and stuff, and I, they would probably replace it for me. So vectors are, are ways that threats can get into a system. So we can, how do I get access to your network? How do I get access to your secret server with the marketing plan that I want to, to uh, get into it? So I can have threats from people from the outside world. And then I can have threats from people that are in the company themselves. Uh, well, what if someone who's actually from a competing corporation in my line of business gets a low paying job in my company, maybe in the help desk department. In the help desk department, they're gonna have access to the internal network. So, you know, they're gonna do their normal lousy job as a help desk person, but then they're gonna to try to try to get into that secret marketing server and steal the plan so they can give it away to their corporation that they're, they're really working for. So we have to not only worry about external threats from the outside world, you know, like from Ukraine or North Korea or whatever, or ransomware people, we have to worry about our own damn internal employees. So we have to have security on the inside of the network, and we have to have security on the outside network as well. So data loss is data that, what's the worst possible data you could lose in your entire company? I'm gonna say it's gonna be your accounts receivable file. That's the file that says all the people that owe you money that are paying you on a monthly basis or whatever, they're paying you for the stuff that they're buying from you. So let's say you didn't use a RAID driver array, and the hard drive failed, and you didn't have a recent backup, you lose your accounts receivable file. Well, what are you going to do now? You're going to call up all your customers and say, you know, we had a hardware failure. We don't know how much you owe us. Uh, can you look at the last bill we sent you and send us that? That might probably be pretty close. And that's not going to work in the business world. We're going to lose customers. We're going to lose revenue. Everyone's going to say, well, we're, what kind of reputation you guys have? You didn't even make a backup of your accounts receivable file. So 90% of companies that lose data because they didn't take good fiscal measures like backing up the data <clears throat> or using red driver race, they're not a business a year later. So we have professionals that do, do stuff like data loss prevention to keep this from happening. And you can bet that the banks do this big time. When's the, how can those banks afford all those marble lobbies? They don't ever lose money. So here are some things that can cause data loss. Uh, if someone could intercept our instant messaging or email, 
uh, if we're using unencrypt, not in using not using encryption or something, then people can get in and, and do that. Uh, cloud storage devices. Well, the cloud is supposed to be password protected, but there's been a lot of instances where companies have put something on a, like a, a, a Amazon cloud and it's come out and they didn't use the proper security on it. Uh, removable media like a USB drive. Uh, drive could go corrupt. Um, hard copy on paper. Uh, if you don't need that anymore, uh, it should be it should be shredded. If the network security access controls themselves are improper, and someone else like that help desk employee, maybe they uh, the rule in security is how much access should I give you? Just what you need. Well, let's give you very little access. If you can't do your job, you'll let me know. And if I gave you too much access, you can see other stuff you shouldn't be able to see. Okay, so we used to call them hackers. And we used to call them malicious users, but we can't call them that anymore because that makes them feel bad. So um, now we have to call them threat actors. So the, the various types of hackers that we have, the white hat hackers are the good guys. So if I don't have any security expertise in my company, I can hire an outside firm of professional security consultants that can come in and try to see how easy it is to break into my company system. And if they find vulnerabilities and problems like that, they can report it to me and we can try to tighten up our system. Gray hat hackers, uh, they, they're not after it for personal gain. They're not going to do it to install ransomware or something. They're just doing it because they're in, interested in researching security. As a matter of fact, they will sometimes, you know, tell the company, I found a security vulnerability here. You guys probably should do something about it. Black hat hackers are the guys that are doing it for the money or they're doing it for malicious reasons. So when the guys come in and install uh, ransomware on your system, and they're saying, we're going to hold, we have encrypted all your data, and we're not going to give your original data back to you, including your accounts receivable file, until you pay us a big ransom. So these are the guys that are doing it for, for very malicious reasons, typically for monetary gain. Now, script kiddies, I'm, okay, it's time for Mark to, to rant. Rant mode on, standing on the soapbox. The term hacker used to be a term of honor among security, among computer programmers and professionals. This was someone who could write a computer program or come up with a piece of hardware that was so elegant and so simple and had the fewest lines of code with the fewest components that was so flabbergasting to all the other people that it left old grizzled old timers shaking their heads in disbelief that this could be done. An example of a hardware person that would be this would be Steve Wozniak, the guy that uh, designed the hardware and the software for the first Apple computer. So he went, he 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 designed a disk drive, a Shugart drive had 80 chips on it. He did it with four chips. That's elegant. But now the term hacker means a bad guy because you've been conditioned by the press. So script kiddies are people that are not experienced hackers or experienced code guys. They just go, they found something on a website. You can go, anybody can go and download a program like uh, like Metasploit and put that on your computer. And there's a bunch of scripts that have already been written that might break into someone's servers that they haven't taken the care to upgrade it with the latest patches. A vulnerability broker is they try to discover exploits, exploits and report them to vendors. Some vendors like Microsoft will pay a bounty. If you discover a flaw in their system, they'll pay you, they might pay you a thousand dollars because you discovered a bug. And it's a lot cheaper for them that you pointed this out to them than for their programmers that are more highly paid. Activists are, I mentioned activists before, hacktivists are an activist that they've got an agenda. Oh, we don't want Bezos the Beast to make an extra profit this week because Amazon Prime Day is happening. And we're going to try to do some denial of service attack and lock down his system. Uh, cyber criminals are the ones that are doing it for the monetary gain. They're the ones that are installing ransomware on all these systems, in medical and, uh, and in uh, government systems and commercial uh, corporations to try to lock them up. And they have to continue doing business. They they, if they don't have good backups, 
they're forced to pay these guys to do it. So they're either doing it by themselves or they're working for large organizations that are highly organized. You know, kind of like, you know, the equivalent of the Cosa Nostra or whatever they're doing this in, in computers. Now, state-sponsored people are people that work for government agencies. So you can bet your boots that the CIA has got highly skilled hacker types trying to break into the Moscow computers, and they're trying to break into North Korea servers so they can see what's going on. They want to see what's going on, what these guys' plans are, so they can try to counteract them. So most countries do this. This is just this is just a good practice in the espionage business. We want to try to keep tracks on what the other guys are doing. So cyber criminals, particularly with with uh, uh, ransomware stuff, they're stealing lots of money. Or they're doing things where they send a fake invoice to <clears throat> the mark to the accounts payable department and make it look like it came from the vice president of finance and have these guys wire a million dollars to some, you know, uh, wire transfer fraud, they're really stealing money. Hacktivists are people that are, uh, uh, they don't like Amazon. They're trying to bring them down. They're going to use freely available tools, like I mentioned, the uh, Metasploit program. You can download Metasploit, and if they haven't had your victim, your target hasn't kept the systems up to date, uh, you're going to be able to go in there and, and, and break into them. State-sponsored ones are the ones like uh, Iran, North Korea, Russia, the United States, Great Britain. All these people are, are checking out, testing the defenses of the other systems and see if they can break into them rather easily. So he gives the example of the Stuxnet malware, which was a... a a uh, code that went on a uh, nuclear a power plant controller. And uh, about 10 years ago or so, Iran's uh, nuclear controller was messed with this because they were trying to, uh, this is widely believed to come from the Israelis. Uh, let me see one thing about the Israelis. They have the best software. They have the best cybersecurity. Palo Alto Linux, Checkpoint Software. These are all Israeli-based companies. If you want a good firewall for your company, do what Tarrant County College did and get a Palo Alto firewall. And you'll be well, well protected. Okay, uh, we're going to not look at this video. Um, I'm going to actually talk about this myself. So uh, attack tools is something that we have to have a technique or tool, like I mentioned, the Metasploit tool. Uh, the script kiddies can, get, can use these, and they don't actually have to be a skilled programmer. So a password cracker is something that I want to recover. I can't log into your system unless I know what your password is. So things like uh, John the Ripper, these programs can can crack passwords. Your only defense against this is making your password um, long and difficult to guess and not consisting of dictionary words. Now, wireless tools can do the same thing where they're trying to find your Wi-Fi password. And some earlier types of Wi-Fi devices were more vulnerable to this. Uh, uh, the newer Wi-Fi encryption tools, they're much more difficult to break into. Uh, network scanning tools. Uh, we can scan and look for open ports. So in map, for example, I can point it to your server at your company and see, oh, look, port 53 is open. It must be a DNS server. Port 20 and 21 are open. You must be an FTP server. Oh, good. That's not encrypted. That's a good target point. Packet crafting tools are tools that can, can try to break into a firewall by creating packets that, that were never intended to be in that fashion. And maybe the programmer forgot to allow for them, and you could use that to break into a system. Now, I'm going to re recommend for a packet sniffer the program called Wireshark. It's an excellent free open source program that's very good about uh, it, uh, listening to the wire and decoding all the packets that's on there. And I can see what's at the data link layer and the physical layer and the network layer and the transport layer and the application layer. And see what's going on in that, in that particular system. So rootkit detectors, uh, the, the term root means I've, I've got access to the root of your system. You've been rooted then. So if I can get to your core of your operating system, it's like I'm the administrator. I can do anything I want to. And he lists some other tools here, uh, hacking operating systems, encryption tools, and so forth. Attack types are types where I want to break into 
uh, I want to listen to your system. Well, I can just run Wireshark and listen to your network traffic. Well, how do I get into the building? How about if I just climb on the phone pole behind the building in the alley and attach some alligator clips to your uh, connection to your internet service provider and I can hear all your traffic. I can sniff it. And he lists some other things there. I like the man in the middle attack. This is what typically happens when someone breaks into a connection between you and your bank and they they see all the data that's going back and forth between the bank. So they'll give, they're going to learn your PIN codes. They're going to learn how much money is in your account and try to try to get your money from the bank. Okay, can you tell who the bad guy is here? Hang on a second. I got to check attendance. You guys look at the bad guy. This is like, it's like spy versus spy. Hang on a I just check some attendance here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, it looks like we did. We did. Okay, so malware is a, 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 some, a bad guy is going to use some tool to, to try to break into our system. So in devices are usually not that well protected. We're going to pretty well lock down our routers and our switches and our servers. But if I can get to an employee desktop PC, it usually doesn't have that great software on it. It's probably got Microsoft Windows, which is a horrible operating system. Uh, Linux is a little better. Mac OS is based on Unix. It's, it's a little better. We want to try to stop these vulnerabilities from being exploited by these guys. So uh, viruses, I need you to do something. I need to seduce you into clicking on a link in an email that looks like, oh, it pretends to be something from the chief operating officer that says, here's the new policy for next year. Click on this PDF file. Read it now. I must read this now. And it's not a PDF file from the chief operating officer. So it's something that's going to install a ransomware link or something on your so it's also some sort of virus on your PC. And then it's going to metastize like a cancer from your PC, which is in the protected internal company network behind the firewall, and try to get to other devices. So viruses can cause all sorts of problems. And by the way, these, these, these ransomware guys are very smart. They infect your systems, and they snoop around for a couple of months. They're looking for your backup systems. They're looking for your ride, uh, RAID driver arrays. And they're going to find them all. And then the night they choose to let everything fall and encrypt everything, they're going to encrypt all your real data on your real servers. And they're going to encrypt all the data on your backup devices. If you have cloud devices like Amazon Cloud, they're going to encrypt those as well. So you want to have any backup of any of your files, and you'll have to pay them the money. So a boot sector virus is a type that it actually, when a, when a PC boots up, he looks at the first sector on the hard disk drive. That's called the boot sector. Look for the top partition table. Oh, it's got, uh, maybe it's a maybe it's one of you guys that took A plus and you have a dual boot Windows and Linux system. So it's got a partition table for the NTFS files for the Windows operating system. And it's got the ext2 extension uh, partition table for the Linux. And they can boot up whichever one you need. The firmware in your PC, this is what you go, when you go into the CMOS setup program on your desktop PC and you say, I want you to boot from the USB drive first, and then I want you to boot from the hard drive. This firmware can be uh, attacked as well and cause the system not to be able to boot properly or boot something they choose instead. Macroviruses, oh, about 20 years ago, these started becoming very popular in that uh, Microsoft Word and Excel have the ability to execute macros. Uh, example, in a PowerPoint slideshow, I might want to have a cute animated graphic showing hello packets going through the OSPF. So the thing is, these macros are very powerful. They have too much power. And if a, a malicious user can inject a macro into what looks like an innocent Word file, it can create a lot of damage on your system. Okay, we talked about viruses. It, uh, uh, they become part of an executable program and use that to propagate through the system. And script viruses go through the operating system interpreter, and they're going to install that ransomware on your system, and you can be toast. So Trojan horse, the Trojan horse from the Greek mythology, they put the soldiers in the wooden Trojan horse and said, we quit, we're going away. And the city that was being attacked brought in the Trojan horse, and then they waited until everyone was asleep, and they came out and they invaded the city in that fashion. So Trojan horses are things that, for example, a rat, remote access Trojan, remote access tool, unauthorized remote access to that device. The famous one from many years ago was 
uh, Microsoft had a program called Back Office, which was a, a, a back office server that ran the company. And uh, the, the unauthorized one was called Back Orifice. It would come in and take over a system for you. So he lists some things there. For example, FTP is very insecure because it doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't encrypt anything. Okay, adware is uh, maybe you download. Have you, you went to and looked at your grandmother's uh, system and the, and you couldn't see anything on the web browser because it was full of all these other ads. They're not dangerous, but they fill up your screen with a bunch of ads and you can't close and you close one, ten more pop up, and so you have to run you know malware bytes or something like that to get rid of this stuff. Ransomware is the one that's really the problem these days. In the last few years, ransomware has exploded. So this is the, they're going to gain access to your system. They're going to wait till the best time, find all your backups, and then in one fell swoop, they're going to encrypt everything. And they're going to say, say um, uh, you can have the, the encryption key, but we're going to have to pay me for it. And you have to do it using Bitcoin or something like that because you can't be traced. A rootkit is a thing that gives you like supervisor administrator level access to a server computer. Uh, spyware is kind of like adware, but it's like checking to see what a person's marketing preferences are. Have you ever noticed that when you go to one website at school and you look at something on Amazon for, I don't know, a guitar, and then you go home or whatever other community you go and look at, all of a sudden a bunch of guitar ads pop up on there. How do they figure that out? Because they track me like a dog with their spyware. Okay, let's look at network attacks. Um, when some sort of bad software gets installed on the, on the PC, we want to do things like install the ransomware and all your systems start worming through there. Let's take a look at these various types of attacks. So, uh, what a not reconnaissance attack is before I actually attack your system. I'm going to perform reconnaissance. For example, if I wanted to break into your system, I could try to ping every possible address that's been assigned to you by your ISP. And I'm looking for anything that responds to a ping. Once I've done that, I might try to use Nmap and see, well, I'm not interested in the useless desktop PCs. I'm interested in the servers. The servers are going to be, you know, file and print sharing, DNS server, DHCP server. I'll be able to find out what ports are open and discover this. And I'm going to do that for actually attacking. So I'm trying to, you know, find out what about your target is. I can go to who is and figure out which web, what IP addresses you've been assigned to. I can ping sweep your entire network. I can port scan addresses that are active to figure out which ones are the juicy servers. Run vulnerability scanners to see uh, what ports are operating, and then try to exploit that and actually break into your real servers. So access attacks include such things as uh, a password attack. I'm going to try to crack your password and so I can log in. Remember that authentication? You only should know your own secret password. Well, I'm going to try every possible password there is in the world and try to break into your system. Or I might try to spoof and pretend to be another device. I might try to do Mac spoofing and pretend to have your Mac address. Or DHCP spoofing and try to be the authorized DHCP server and, uh, you know, Come up with a fake default gateway that's me and everything's being channeled through me now. Social engineering is uh, not using technical. I'm not doing a password cracker and finding out what your password is. I'm going to, you know, people just want to be helpful. So you might be working and you get a phone call and you're in a large company and, hey, this is Fred from the network engineering department and we fixed that collision domain problem that was in your building, and uh, can I verify that? Just give me your password. No, no, you should never give your password to anybody. It doesn't matter how plausible it sounds. If someone calls with some pretext asking you for your password, they ain't with the company. Real people will never ask you in the company. They know they're not supposed to ask for your password, because you probably have some security policy that's don't tell your password to anybody else. Not even to your boss. Your boss doesn't need your password. If he needs to see your files, he'll go to the IT department, and they will grant him access to your files. He doesn't need your password. Doesn't matter what they say, they never need your password. That's a red flag. Never give your password away. But you're just trying to be helpful. So pretexting is pretending to be like from the IT department. Phishing is uh, uh, 
send an email that looks real, but really when you click on that link, you really installed ransomware or something in your in your company. A spam mail, unsolicited commercial email, just waste everybody's time. Uh, something for something, quid pro quo, they want something. They're going to try to give you a gift. Many companies have a policy that you are not allowed to accept any kind of gifts of any monetary value. Now, have you heard of this one? You go to work and you look outside on the parking lot and there's a flash drive lying on the pavement. What are you going to do with it? You're going to pick it up, bring it into work, put it in your work drive to see what's in it. And it'll have a little label on it, something like salaries, to make it more interesting. But it's really not that. It's really installing some ransomware program on your inside PC. And you just bypass that $750,000 Palo Alto firewall that was installed in your system and came right into the interior system. Personation, trying to pretend to be somebody else. Um, tailgating. Many companies have card keys to get into there, and the employees will go outside, they'll go on a smoke break. And you sort of hang around there and wait till someone else opens the door to go in, and you're not with the company. You're uh, just tailgating in beside that person. Um, have you noticed when you put your passwords into the Cisco routers and switches and you type them in, it doesn't show on the screen? It shows nothing, not even stars or asterisks. So if someone, if you type in something over a shoulder and, and someone's looking over a shoulder and they could see the password, they could learn the password. And people could rummage through your trash and look for it. It's amazing the amount of information that gets thrown away in the trash that shouldn't be there. It should be shredded or burned first. So social engineering is something that helps the white hat hackers. These are the guys that are trying to protect our company and you know use best practices and you know do everything. We take a reasonable effort so that uh, something happens and we get sued. We can say, we did our own due diligence here. Um, uh, we tried to do this, but they were just too smart. They were North Koreans or Russians. They were just too smart, of course. So these are things what you should do, like always sign out of your computer. Don't use weak passwords. Uh, don't put information on Facebook. Uh, be careful when you open emails. Never give your password away to anybody. Uh, what was the thing they said during uh, uh, the previous administration? If you see, if you see something, say something. Okay, denial of service attacks. This is my example of, of we hate Bill Bezos. He's a beast, and we try, Amazon's making too much money now. So what we're going to do is overwhelm you with a bunch of traffic. Have you remember the TCP three-way handshake? Uh, host computer, client computer sends the sync request. And the server sends back a sync act, and then the PC sends back uh, sync sync act, act, and you get the three-way connection, and you can start sending your, your data. Well, if I get 50,000 of my friends to send a sync to Amazon, and Amazon sends back 50,000 sync acts, and my 50,000 guys never send the final act, I've clogged up 50,000 channels of communication into Amazon. Oh dear. So uh, that's one way we can try to do the denial, distributed denial of service attack. We can send uh, uh, packets from hell that are maliciously formatted. They're going to try to crash your device. OK, IP and ICMP attacks. OK, IP version 4, IP version 6 are the layer 3 network packets that we're commonly using these days. We're trying to migrate away from P4 and go to IP version 6. So a, a ping attack or internet control message protocol attack is we're going to try to do a mess with the routing tables, to generate floods, then off service floods of attack. Amplification or reflection attacks. We're going to we're going to find 50,000 home users that we've taken over their home PCs and send a secret chat command and make them attack Amazon all in the same day. Address spoofing attack is we're going to create a packet. It, and we're not going to put our real IP address on there as a source. We'll track us back. We're going to put in a fake one. Maybe try to fake an address within your interior of your company. Man in the middle attack is where we try to, to get in between you and your banking service and try to intercept all that data, pass it on, and, uh, and you know copy down account numbers and stuff when we do this stuff. Uh, in the session hijacking, we're going to gain access to the network and then go to man in the middle attack. So Internet Control Message Protocol is a whole family of things. The, normally what we use it for is echo request and echo reply, the ping function. 
So we can we can use access control lists, which we're going to look at, I think, next week. Access control lists, we can actually filter on all sorts of things. And uh, for example, many companies don't allow you to ping inside their interior network because that's a reconnaissance thing from a hacker who's trying to figure out what IP addresses you have that respond and which ones are servers. So many companies, if you try to ping them, the ping won't go through. Uh, I think Yahoo works. You can ping Yahoo and it'll work. So we can use intrusion detection systems and firewalls to try to protect against this type of stuff. So echo request, echo reply. That's the ping function. Let me make sure the host is there. Uh, ICMP unreachable, mask reply redirects, and router discovery. These are used to try to put bad routing entry tables in or uh, try to map out internal networks when we have no business being there because we're an outside hacker. Okay, an amplification attack is, I'm the bad guy, I've got the orange PC, number one guy. You can tell I'm the bad guy because I'm wearing a black hat. So that's the thing I like about Westerns. Uh, first of all, you have great outside scenery. But second of all, the bad guys always wear a black hat and the good guys always wear a white hat. So it's always easy to tell who's the good guy, who's the villain. Well, this is our villain who's wearing a black hat. So he's going to try to break into our system. He's going to send, he's going to go to with a secret chat command and take over 50,000 home computer users that have been uh, zombified, all your bases are belong to us, and then attack that one victim server at the company and try to overwhelm him. So spoofing attacks is we want to pretend to be another IP address and what we really are. Now, yeah, most ISPs try to prevent this with an access control list because inside Tarrant County College, we're using you know, private inside IP addresses, RFC 1918 addresses like 10.92.168, just like you do at home. And so ISPs will filter if I pretend to be 192.168 in the, you know, the, the South Campus Business Lab, uh, the ISP won't pass that. If he encounters any private Inside addresses on the outside area are dropped, so we can pretend we can we can defend against this. Now TCP, the hot Christmas tree attack. There are we know about sync, sync, act, act. There's six functions in the TCP control bits. Normally, all six of these are not on at the same time. Someone figured out several years ago that if they turn on all six of these, Microsoft servers crash, and then you can use a buffer overflow and take over that server, even though you don't know the administrator's password. So TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, it really has three basic things. It provides reliable end-to-end -end delivery, positive acknowledgement and delivery of stuff because it sends a segment of data, it waits for the receiver to acknowledge that he got the data error-free without any problem, and he sends a second segment and so forth. And if the receiver doesn't get a segment for some reason, he won't send the act back, and the transmitter of the data will simply send a replacement copy out there. Uh, flow control, TCP has flow control, which means that if it's Amazon Prime Day and everybody in the world is trying to connect to the Amazon Web Server and buy that really cheap uh, tablet, the Amazon server can send a message back, I'm really busy right now, and you slow down. I know you got a gigabit connection at home there, but you're going to have to send a little slower to me because I'm very busy right now. And TCP is stable in that it maintains the communication between the parties. You have the TCP three-way handshake. You have sync act, sync act, as all the segments are sent. And then you tear the connection down with fin act, fin act at the end. So it maintains all these things for us. So here we have the sync, sync act, act connection. You start a TCP session, you send the sync request to the server, the server responds to it and says sync act back to you. And then you say act, the connection is established, and now we can actually start transmitting real data. So we'll send the segments of data and they'll all be, they'll all be uh, set up. So with the flood attack, I'm going to send a bunch of syncs. And the web server is going to send back the sync acts and wait. But I filled up all this open channels. And now the legitimate user there at the bottom, number three, our purple shirt legitimate system administrator guy, he sends a sync request. And the web server can't let him log in because he's too busy timing out waiting for these others. So denial of service attack. 
When we terminate a TCP session, it's fan ack, fan ack. You say, well, we've completed the entire service pack, we download the whole file, and we're going to close the connection so that I can have room for another connection to come in instead. So an uh, attacker could send the reset, false reset, and get your session. Uh, UDP is the sort of quick and dirty version of TCP. There is no acknowledgments. There is no maintaining a stateful session. Um, this is used for quick and dirty stuff like a, a DNS request to the server. Quick, Mr. DNS server, look up the web server hickshacks.com and tell me what its IP address is. And it says it back very fast. That's UDP because if we or our streaming audio and video, if we if we acknowledge each and every packet of streaming audio and video, it would be too slow. It would be unworkable. So we use UDP for things like streaming audio, streaming video, and a simple DNS name request. So UDP, we can use a flood. We can flood it. Someone do the do the TCP and try to to uh, um, remove availability of something. Okay, address resolution protocol is this feature. That in Ethernet, we have a MAC address, a physical address that's turned into every Ethernet adapter. And we need to correlate or line that up with our layer three IP address. So you notice at any time in the lab, you do the ping, the first ping fails. And then the rest of the pings work fine for three minutes. What's happening is the ARC cache hasn't been updated yet with the proper correlation between that specific MAC address and that specific IP address. It takes a second, and all the succeeding pings work just fine. So something you should never use on a system is called a gratuitous ARC. Uh, that's bad practice. It should be disabled. It's disabled by default on all Cisco routers. You have to turn them off if you need it for any reason. I can't think of any good reason for it. So we're not going to poison our ARC caches using this. So here's an example. Number one, PCA needs a MAC address of its default gateway. So it sends an ARC request to the uh, router's default gateway address, 192.168.10.1. He updates his cache and uh, sends an ARC reply. The router sends an ARC reply to PCA. And then the threat actor sends gratuitous ARC replies using his own MAC address. What he's trying to do is, instead of using that legitimate default gateway, your friend in the neighborhood router, he's trying, the threat actor's trying to use his device instead so he can be a man in the middle and he can see everything that's going on there. So this can be defeated by proper programming and configuration of devices. Okay, DNS. DNS was invented many years ago when security was not a concern. So um, if I can uh, try to attack your DNS server, I can wreak havoc with your system. Let me mention at this time that you are not required to use the DNS address that your internal it's your internet service provider provides for you. You can change that. You can go into the Windows or the Macintosh and leave the DHCP IP address of MS default gateway there and change the DNS server. So I like the Quad9 project. 9.9.9.9 as a DNS server will filter out a lot of the bad sites. There's also the 1.1.1.1 project. They have a feature that if you have children in your family, you can put in an IP uh, a DNS server that filters uh, adult content information that you don't want your children to see. Thank you, open DNS. And uh, uh, Google gives you, I think, 8.8.8.8. I prefer 9.9.9.9, or you can use the open DNS project if you want to protect your children. So an open resolver attack is uh, I'm going to poison your DNS cache in your system. I'm going to do a reflection attack and try to do a knock service attack. So be careful with DNS. DNS tunneling is putting non-DNS traffic within. Now, DNS, only legitimate, legitimate use of DNS is uh, your host name is uh, company.com. What is the IP address of that server? Because we can't expect our users to type in actual IP addresses. So what we can do is use that to exfiltrate or send other data and hide it within a DNS request. I want to send a command and control command to a botnet and have them do my 50,000 home PCs denial of service attack on Jeff Bezos and Amazon this week because it's a 
Prime, Amazon Prime week. So we have to check our DNS traffic and, and be careful with it. Um, there's a new movement these days that DNS, encrypt all DNS traffic in, in encryption. Just like you do now when you go to your banking account or go to a merchant and put in a credit card account. I should see, I, I anticipate that's going to roll out more in the future and DNS will be more protected. DHCP is the dynamic host configuration protocol, which is used everywhere now in both home users and corporate users. Came around in the mid 90s. Um, I can say that this is, this, is, this is the best thing since slide rules because we used to have to statically configure every individual PC, every individual device in the home network. We had to statically configure them. There was no automatic configuration device. So DHCP does this automatically. You can take your laptop computer to any room in the, any building of any TCC campus, and you'll get a proper network address that's at that particular location. Now, the problem is anybody can pretend to be a DHCP server, and Give a fake address or give you a fake default gateway so they can be the man in the middle attack on you. So the way DHCP normally works is the client machine on the right sends out a broadcast message saying, discover, I'm looking for DHCP servers. One or more DHCP servers will respond to yours saying, I'm a DHCP server and I can give you an address. And then the client machine sends back another broadcast message saying, I accept your offer. There could be more than two. Microsoft recommends you have two DHCP servers because why? Microsoft servers crash all the time. So we need to have at least one running. And then the, the server will acknowledge that you get to use that IP address and you can start becoming a part of the network. Now the server on the left is an authorized server. And we can take some steps uh, with Cisco devices and even with Microsoft. Microsoft, you can go into the Active Directory controller and uh, only DHCP servers that are authorized by Active Directory can work. And if some idiot marketing member buys a $20 Linksys router from Fry's and plugs it into his cube and goes to the break room because he wants to use the laptop in the break room, that DHCP server is not going to function on the network. It'll be shut out. So a DHCP spoofing attack is we connect a rogue DHCP server, and we're going to do things like point into a wrong default gateway, one that I'm going to use for a man in the middle attack if I'm an attacker, except to the wrong DNS server. There was a controversy several years ago some of the cable companies set up their DNS servers when you mistype, say you were going to Microsoft.com and you misspelled it slightly. It would give you targeted advertising from their DNS server. That's not a good business practice. Now the cable companies were doing it. So we want to protect against bad DHCP servers. So let's say that a threat actor has put a rogue DHCP server and we haven't used Microsoft Active Directory authorization and we haven't done any of the things with Cisco routers and switches for trusted and untrusted ports. And this bad guy, marketing managers, links this server, is on the network. And someone broadcasts a request. They come in from lunch and they didn't come in that morning. They turn on their PC. It sends out a DHCP broadcast looking for a server. Both servers get the message. And a client's normally going to respond to the first one. So the marketing managers links this router. It's closer. And he gets the offer. The client receives the rogue offer first. He takes that. And uh, so now he's got an improper address or it was a malicious user. The marketing manager, he's not a malicious user. He's just an idiot. What if it was a malicious user that was trying to redirect everything for a man in the middle of tax? You need to defend against those sort of things. Now, you're going to do the lab, a DNS stuff lab in the, in the next uh, a third session. Um, let me mention again that this cannot be done in Packet Tracer. Uh, you guys that come in person to the lab on Thursday, we'll do it on our Windows desktop machines using the Wireshark program. If you want to do it from home, um, I put a link in the recorded presentations where you can download Wireshark. It's a free open source program, a very fine program, and it had, they have a Macintosh version and they have a Windows version. So let's look at some best practices for security. Okay, I started talking about this a little earlier. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So this is the triad of security, the three-legged stool. If they need uh, one leg of a three-legged stool, stool is there, the stool falls down. So confidentiality, only authorized individuals can get sensitive information. You could use cryptography here. Integrity is we want uh, to make sure the data can't be altered. 
And availability means anybody can get to the data they need, they need to do to do their job. Uh, and we might have fault tolerance, redundant things like redundant gateways, RAID driver rays, two fiber optic cables instead of one, uh, either channel, uh, uh, things of that nature so that the system is always available when we need it. So defense in depth, I'd like to, security is a process, not a product. Sure, we can buy a three quarter million dollar Palo Alto firewall, put it on our system, and but we can't say, well, that's it. We don't need to do anything else now. We need to do a lot of things in depth. We need to train our employees not to reveal their password. And security is like layers of an onion. If the guy, if the malicious user can get past one layer of the onion, maybe another layer will stop him. So we're gonna implement a firewall. But we're also going to, to, to uh, maybe put some antivirus software on our employees' desktop PCs. We're going to harden our routers and our switches to make them harder to break into. And we're going to encrypt our data as it travels across different links, particularly between campuses where it's on fiber optic cables we don't have any control over. So a firewall is a device that it's, we're going to do access control lists. We're going to see how to turn our $1,000 French office Cisco routers to a firewall, much like your home $50 home Linksys router, it has a firewall function. It prevents some traffic from the outside world from coming back in. Everyone's trying to break into all your PCs. So we want to, there's, there's two philosophies in security. Let's allow all traffic except that traffic which is explicitly denied, or let's deny all traffic except that which is explicitly allowed. The first one we use for many years these days, we have to be really tough. Uh, we're only, all traffic is denied, except that traffic which is specifically allowed. So we're going to allow traffic to our servers. We're going to allow incoming email requests. We're going to allow people to come to our internal web server so they can see our products and buy them. We're going to disallow incoming things. We're going to disallow any, um, Microsoft NetBIOS file sharing stuff. That's very dangerous. So we're going to tune our network so the only stuff that can get in there is stuff that we allow. And our security manager and our chief security officer will, will do that for us. Now, even though we're in, employing a firewall, what if some, some stuff gets into the network anyway? Or what is from an internal user who's already inside the firewall? So an intrusion protection system or intrusion detection system, these are are machines that are configured to look at the traffic in the inside network that's already there. And if they see something that's not, that's out of place, they can either, they can detect it and send warning messages to the security people, or they can quench it, they can protect against it. So there's a um, open source IDS called Snort, we call it the pig. Uh, it was recently, I think it was bought by Cisco, it was bought by some big company. They still have the free open source version out there. So we can employ these devices and tap them into various points in our internal network and our local networks, look for stuff that could be bad and at least warn us, if not single-handedly do something against it without waiting for us to do it. So the IPS here, here's the malicious user from the outside world. He's coming through the cloud and he's connected to our company and he somehow bypassed the Palo Alto firewall and put something in the inside network that shouldn't be there. So the intrusion protection system is going to determine that it's a bad packet and he will drop the packet. And he will only allow, in this case, the guy was trying to get to the management console for our Cisco router switch and he was trying to change the configuration. So he knows, he knows what the password is. But the intrusion protection system prevented this from happening. So this is, um, okay, I'm sorry, this is Cisco marketing fluff. Cisco markets some devices that protect against email and web traffic in and out of the company to, you know, check for blacklists and whitelists and try to keep people from accidentally going to something that would mess up the inside of the company. Okay, I talked a little bit about, about cryptography. Um, we can use cryptography to do many things, like, for example, I want to generate a hash to make sure that when I send data to you and you, you receive the data, that's okay. We already saw this with Ethernet. Whenever Ethernet frame sends data, he calculates a cyclic redundancy checksum, a frame check sequence, 32 bit. He puts it on the end of the frame. When the receiving workstation receives the Ethernet frame, 
he recalculates the CRC, the frame check sequence, it should be identical. It should calculate to be the same 30-bit value. If they don't, it was altered or there was a collision, there was some problem with it, and Ethernet says bogus, he drops the data. Uh, message Digest 5 is what we use when we do enable C class and you show run. It says enable secret has a number five, that makes it MP5. And then it has the encrypted password. So the, the word class isn't present on the screen where anybody can see it. Origin authentication means that we can make sure it came from who we said it was. Maybe you go and you download a version of Linux. The Linux vendor will publish a hash code so that when you download it and you can run the hash on it yourself to make sure it matches what he published on his website, you know you didn't get a bogus download. Uh, confidentiality means that only authorized users can see the information. So we can use, uh, well, we'll use, we'll use asymmetric encryption to send the shared symmetric secret key and then switch to the shared secret key because it's much faster. Now, digital signatures. Um, Non-repudiation means, uh, uh, let's say a message is sent by somebody and they say, oh, I didn't send that. That's not mine. Well, it's got your digital signature in it. You must have sent it. So non-repudiation means uh, we can prove it came from a particular sender. That means we know it really came from the chairman of the board because it has this digital signature in it. Okay, now let's look at my bank example. Data integrity. Okay, I want to send this. What's this Chase Pay thing? You break the guy's window and you send him $100 because you broke his window and it shows up on his phone right away. Well, I want to make sure that when I send you the $100 because I accidentally broke your window, that you only get the $100, not $1,000. So I'm going to hash that value and then send it to you. And if a hacker goes in the middle there and puts the extra zero in it, the hash won't match. The hash will be completely different if even one bit is different. Same way that Ethernet tells that any data has been altered in Ethernet frame. He won't trust it anymore. So MD5 is getting kind of long in the tooth now. It's only 128-bit uh, hash code. SHA-2 is a little bit better. You can use this on some newer network devices. You can, use, you can enable your secret password with a, a more powerful encryption code. Uh, so if someone can compute the hash, they have the correct hash for that. If they can substitute that with your old hash, they can successfully change your password. So this means the man in the middle attacks are possible and they don't give any uh, protection against that stuff. So origin authentication is, we wanna use a thing called keyed hash message authentication called HMAC. So we're gonna use any, crypt, any cryptographic algorithm that generates a secret key secret shared key. And only people that have access to that secret key can compute the digest. So that way, man in the middle attacks are defeated. So banks use, like to use things like this because banks don't like people that come to them and say, you stole my money. Confidentiality is uh, when we go to put our credit card to a merchant account or, or go to the bank and transfer money back and forth. Uh, I talked about symmetric encryption shared secret key, and I talked about asymmetric encryption, a public and private key. Uh, that's like having two, lock, two keys, one locks and one unlocks. Uh, so we want to use symmetrical encryption when possible because it's very fast. But the problem is, how do I get the key to you? Well, I'm going to use asymmetrical encryption, public private key pairs to send you the shared secret key, and then we're going to switch to the shared code, which will run much faster. So when you go to a website that's httpschase.com, this is what's happening. So in symmetric encryption, the same exact key, pre-shared key, both encrypts and decrypts. In asymmetric encryption, there, there are two keys for it. So here's some examples of symmetric encryption. DES, uh, triple DES, advanced encryption standard, uh, SEAL, and RIVES are examples of shared secret keys. The problem is the distribution of the key. But we use asymmetric encryption to distribute the key to you. We're not going to put it in the envelope and mail it to Moscow. The KGB will steam open the envelope and get the key. So asymmetric encryption is public, private, uh, public key algorithms. This solves the problem. I can publish my public key to everybody in the world. 
No one has my private key. Whichever key encrypts something, only the other key can decrypt it. So you have my public key, you can send me a message encrypted with my public key, only I, you can be assured that only I can read it. So we're gonna use long key links here, 512 to 4096 bits. So when you installed that, when you did that lab where you installed the secure shell function to the Cisco switch, you had to install, a, create a public private key pair. And I think the default was 1024, but you can choose longer lengths. These days you want to use maybe 4,000 bits instead, be more reliable. So internet key exchange, secure socket layer, transport layer security. That's when you use the HTTPS website. That's the protocol they use. Secure shell uses this. Uh, pretty good privacy is an open source program that you can uh, uh, use to encode information and send it to other people. They can only see it, see it if they have the key to decrypt it with. Notice this next to the last point. Asymmetric algorithms are substantially slower. So we'll use them to exchange the key and then we'll switch to very fast symmetric encryption instead. All these encryption algorithms use prime numbers. As an example, if I gave you two 10-digit prime numbers and I said, multiply these two 10-digit prime numbers together and tell me what the product is. That's easy. Now, here's a 20-digit product of two prime numbers. Factor it into the two individual prime numbers that it was multiplied together. together. That is extremely mathematically difficult, and that's the basis for encryption. It is very difficult to come up with these arbitrary prime numbers. So here's some asymmetric encryption keys, uh, Diffie-Hellman, ESS, DSA, RSA. It's like a Chinese menu here. Choose one from column A and one from column B. When we do the IPsec, we can choose whichever encryption algorithm we want to. So Diffie-Hellman is, uh, it's been around for a long time. Um, uh, IP security, VPNs is typically the use of this. You can encrypt the internet, encrypt the information on the internet using secure socket layer, transport layer security, they're roughly equivalent. And then we can log into our switch with our password and secure shell data uh, configure, configure and maintain that switch. Unbelievably large prime numbers, very slow. Uh, we're going to use this to distribute the key and then we'll switch to a symmetric key for the bulk of our traffic because it's so much faster. And I'll leave this for you to guys to read later. Oh, well, then that's it then. That's it then. Okay then. All right. So, You guys that want to come in person on Thursday at 9 a.m., uh, we'll do this lab on the Windows machines there. Uh, you guys that want to do the lab from home, uh, this lab doesn't work on Packet Tracer. Just use your home PC. It can be Macintosh. It can be Windows. It can be Linux. And download that link I put in the recorded presentations file to download the copy of Wireshark and install it on your PC and perform that lab. He's going to have you go to sosua.com website and then look at the Wireshark, look, looking at that port 53 DNS lookups. See what it looks like in Washington. Let's see any chat questions. Okay, uh, guys, let me stop recording here. Hold on a second. <laughs>